Museum. We are on week three, I believe, of our past to present lecture series. And today we are welcoming Julia Kider from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So Julia is the project manager of the Mouth of the Columbia at the Portland District U.S. Army Corps. With a bachelor's degree in civil engineering, she brings four years of experience in navigation. Julia's expertise lies in overseeing and managing the dredging operations at the mouth of the Columbia River, ensuring smooth navigation for commercial vessels and maintaining the vitality of this waterway. So without further ado, please welcome Julia Kider. for coming and thanks to Julia for um, that wonderful introduction. Uh, like she said, my name is also Julia, so it will be pretty easy to remember today. Um, and I work for the Portland District Army Corps of Engineers um, and yeah, I'm the project manager for the Mouth of the Columbia River Federal Navigation Channel and also some side channels like Baker Bay, Chinook, and Skibidon. But today we're going to focus on what it takes to maintain the Federal Navigation Channel at the mouth of the Columbia River. Um, so yeah, I'll kind of give Army Corps perspective, and then if you're here next week, I saw that the Columbia River Bar pilots are coming to talk, so um, we'll get kind of another perspective if you come next week on what it's like to navigate the mouth of the Columbia River. Uh, so yeah, let's get into it. I forgot I have a clicker. We test this and everything. <laughs> there it goes. Okay. <laughs> so first I'll go over kind of like a history and background of the mouth of the Columbia River and then also a, just a general overview of what the Portland District Army Corps of Engineers does, mainly the navigation program. Uh, and then I'll kind of get into more of the weeds of what is dredging and what do we do with the dredge material that we dredge up from the river. Um, so. The majority of this presentation is based on kind of the dredging mission. That's kind of what my team does on the day-to-day -day life. Um, but I will also go over the jetties because they're just as important to maintaining the mouth of the Columbia. Here's just kind of a fun picture. I took that one while I was on the dredge boat Ession. So I'll talk about that boat later. And also I was able to go up in a Coast Guard helicopter to collect some data. So um, I, that was like one of the best days of my life. So I have to go there. <laughs> <laughs> that looks so official. Um, so the Army Corps of Engineers is a huge organization. Um, today, again, I'm only going to kind of touch on the navigation mission, which is to provide safe, reliable, efficient, and environmentally sustainable waterborne transportation systems for movement of commerce, national security needs, and recreation. So kind of, that's kind of the overall navigation mission of the Army Corps of Engineers and the mouth is very important for that navigation mission. So more specifically, uh, this is the Portland District navigation pro projects. And so all those yellow dots that you see are different navigation projects. And um, we have 10 deep draft harbors. We have 12 shallow draft harbors, 12 large scale jetty systems, one's here at the mouth, and then the rest are up all up and down the Oregon coast, also mainly on the mouths to rivers and inlets. Um, and then we maintain 224 miles of waterways. Um, so that's a huge stretch of water. Over 100 miles of that is just in the Columbia River. Um, so our group you know, looks at all these miles year to year and determines what needs to be dredged and how we're going to accomplish the mission to maintain those waterways. And then we also have three high lift navigation locks and those are in the Columbia River. Um, again, for the purpose for today, we're going to focus on the best project, even though I'm biased, which is the mouth of the Columbia River navigation project. Um, which is kind of right outside our door and Fort Stevens and Cape Disappointment. If you've ever been there, you've seen the mouth and you've seen the jetties that um, kind of make up the mouth of the Columbia River. So if you've ever been to this museum and explored around, you know that the mouth of the Columbia River also <coughs> has a nickname of the Graveyard of the Pacific. Um, before the mouth of the Columbia River was improved for navigation during 1885 and 1939, it was one of the most dangerous bar crossings in the world. Um, so I'm pretty sure there's a map out there that shows like, all the shipwrecks that have happened in the mouth over the years. Um, so it's just a testament how dangerous this 
um, Rivermouth was. Um, there's a lot of, you know, history like Stanley logs like this one. It says the terrors of the bar of the Columbia are one of the most fearful sights that can possibly meet the eye of the sailor. Um, so it just didn't sound like a, a fun time to go through the mouth of the Columbia River. It was a very dynamic entrance which is kind of shown in this graphic here. So this is a map of the mouth of the Columbia River from 1854. Um, you can see it's pretty wide and those darker red areas are what we call like sand spits. So they're kind of shallower areas that often caused ships to run aground. And back then they were very dynamic. They would kind of move around and then that would often cause ships to crash. And so that's why the entrance was so dangerous and then in tandem with the mighty Columbia clashing with the Pacific Ocean, it's just extremely tre treacherous area. Um, I like to highlight the fact that the mouth used to be five miles wide. And so again, not one main channel. It was kind of, you can kind of see two channels. Um, and again, very dynamic environment um, that changes often. So fast forward a hundred years, this is a map from 1950 and it shows the conditions of the mouth of the Columbia River once the Army Corps built the jetty system out there. And so in red, I kind of try to highlight the jetties in red. You can see the south jetty, the north jetty, and then jetty A is kind of on the end of Cape Disappointment. Um, but these jetties basically act as a barrier and kind of block a lot of the wave action and storms from hitting um, the main channel at the mouth of the Columbia River. Um, so I'll go a little bit more into detail on the jetties here. But so you can see now the entrance to the mouth of Columbia River is only two miles wide. So a lot narrower in one single channel instead of a very dynamic five mile area. So it's kind of what the mouth of the Columbia River looks like today. Um, this viewpoint is if you're coming in from the west and looking east into the river. Um, we have the mouth of the Columbia River Federal Navigation Channel. The actual channel has like exact dimensions that were authorized by Congress in 1884. Um, they, the channel is six miles long, it's 2,640 feet wide, and it's maintained to about a depth of 55 feet. I'll get into more details on that later. Um, but the jetties, so we have the South Jetty, if you've ever been to Fort Stevens, um, you've probably seen it. It was built between 1885 and 1913, and it's six miles long. It's our longest jetty. Um, and it's currently actually being uh, rehabbed right now. So if you've been out to Fort Stevens in the past like four years, or if you go in the next couple years, um, you'll see active jetty construction going on. Um, so major like project, they're rehabbing the whole thing. Even in this picture, you can see the tip of the South Jetty has um, been pretty beat up by the waves and eroded. So they're going in there and they're beefing up the entire jetty to make it last longer and protect the channel. Um, then we have the North Jetty as well, which is on the north side of the mouth of the Columbia. It's two and a half miles long and it was built between 1914 and 1917. That one was also rehabbed pretty recently. I believe construction finished around 2018. Um, so the jetty's in pretty good shape now after that rehab. Um, then we have Jetty A, which is one mile long. It's kind of in the back. Some people don't even notice it. Um, but this one is pretty important. It's one mile long and it was built between 1938 and 1939. And behind Jetty A is actually the Baker Bay Federal Navigation Channel. Um, that channel is very important because it's home to the um, Cape Disappointment U.S. Coast Guard station. And that station performs all the search and rescue missions within 50 nautical miles of the mouth of the Columbia River. So very important to keep that channel safe and open for the Coast Guard to go in and out of the mouth and perform those search and rescue calls. Um, last stat I saw was they refer, perform around three to 400 search and rescue calls every single year so extremely important they have a lot to work of work to do so we don't want to stand in their way so we maintain that navigation channel and just because the mouth of the columbia river has been um, updated and uh, safer navigation has been built it's still a pretty treacherous entrance um, it's not 
like this great place now that the jetties are in place. There's so, you know, ocean storms, giant swells. Um, it can be very dangerous to transit across the mouth of the Columbia River, um, especially in the fall and winter. Conditions can change from like calm to life threatening, um, as well as five minutes just to the change of the direction of wind or like ocean swells coming in. So just because we have the jetties, it can still be pretty treacherous. Um, so why, why did we build these jetties? Why do we have this navigation channel that we need to maintain every year? Um, and it's because it supports the Columbia Snake River navigation system. And so this system supports 49 million tons of cargo annually, which is worth about $25 billion of commerce. So that's a huge number. $25 billion of commerce is coming in and out of the mouth of the Columbia River every single year. Um, it's also the largest wheat and barley export gateway in the world. I mean, sorry, in the nation, not the world. <laughs> it's the second largest soy export gateway in the world. And then it supports around 40,000 local jobs. Uh, so the mouth of the Columbia River is very important to not only the local economy, but like our nation's economy. So that's why we spend this money to build the jetties and also to dredge annually. If you see that little star in the corner, that's where we are, just for reference. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of see where the North Jetty, South Jetty orientation is from here. So since the mouth of the Columbia River is so important and so big, we have many stakeholders that we work with. Um, the stakeholders are basically just the users of the mouth of the Columbia River. All of them have very differing interests. So for example, like the Columbia River bar pilots do not have the same um, interests as the Columbia River Crab Fishers Association. Um, so we have to kind of balance all the users at the mouth of the Columbia River and make sure like all their needs are being met and like balancing the needs to make sure we still maintain the federally authorized navigation channel so ships can still make it through because that's our main mission. But we want to do it in a way where we don't do any harm and we like help the environment. So that's kind of our goal. Okay, so I've kind of been over like Jenny's background, what the Army Corps does. Um, and so now I'm gonna focus more on dredging from this point on. Um, so the jetties aren't enough to keep the federal navigation channel open year round. Um, and so we need to dredge it annually and have the jetties there to fully keep the Columbia River entrance open to navigation. So we can't just have one or the other, we need both to maintain this waterway. So now we're going into dredging. Um, so what is dredging? I'm originally from Kansas and I honestly didn't know a lot about dredging. <laughs> um, or the ocean. When I came here I was like, wow, it's magical. Um, but dredging is essentially like underwater excavation. Um, so it's the removal of sand from the navigation channel to make way um, for like boats. So Today I'm going to focus mainly on hopper dredging. So these dredges are self-propelled. Um, this figure kind of shows the one with yellow and blue in it. That's just the basics of our hopper dredge. And so they essentially come to the river, they lower the trailer arms. They have these two arms that lower down to the bottom of the river where we need the, them to scoop up the sand essentially and they suction, like essentially vacuum the floor, the bottom of the river and pump up the sand into a hopper. So the hopper is basically just a containment for the sand inside the dredge. Um, so you can kind of see the figure, the yellow is like the sand pumping up and then getting stored in the hopper. Um, and then once the hopper is full, the, they raise the drag arms and then they transit to a placement site. And so then that's where the other half of the work goes is where you place all this sand. And this diagram kind of shows what the placement looks like. The hopper dredge actually releases the sand from the bottom of the dredge. So like our, um, our dredge essayons has like six doors at the bottom that they can open and then all the sand comes out the bottom. Um, so that's just kind of a figure that shows what happens when you release the sand. 
And so like I said, um, the Army Corps actually owns a couple dredges. We have the dredge Essayons and the dredge Uquina. Those are the two that work on the West Coast. Um, I work mainly with the dredge Essayons. It's the bigger of the two. The Uquina mainly goes in the smaller ports um, along the coast and then also in the river, the lower Columbia River. We also have a whole array of survey vessels. They're, they're working year round to make sure we have the data we need to make decisions about where to dredge. Um, the Port of Portland also owns a dredge that we use to dredge the lower Columbia River. It's a pipeline dredge. It is not ever worked at the mouth because it would get destroyed. Um, and then we have two contract dredges that we have every single year. So we have the West Coast Hopper Dredge contract, which is where we get another hopper dredge out here, um, similar size to the Essayons. And then we have the Clamshell Dredge, which is kind of that bottom figure, I guess I have a pointer. That's the Clamshell Dredge. And that mainly works the side channels, like the Baker Bay channel I was talking about, the Clamshell Dredge it's in that area because it's able to maneuver more and it's smaller, so it gets to smaller places. So for today, I'm gonna to focus on these two, which is the dredge Essions and then the contract hopper dredge. These are the two that work at the mouth of the Columbia River. All the other dredges are not able to work. We need hopper dredges at the mouth of the Columbia River. And why? So hopper dredges are specialty equipment. They're, again, self-propelled ships that are highly maneuverable. Um, so they can, you know, remove shoals from these dangerous coastal entrances. Um, there are a limited number of dredges of like contract hopper dredges available nationally. Um, so it's always, I wouldn't say a struggle, but there's always competition to get a dredge boat out on the West Coast. Most contract dredges are on the East Coast and in the Gulf because they have year-round work for them. Here on the West Coast, because of weather windows and just the work we have, we cannot keep a dredge, a hopper dredge on the West Coast all year round. Um, so we actually have to pay them to go through the Panama Canal and to the West Coast almost every year. And then they go back and dredge on the East Coast and in the Gulf during um, kind of our off season. Okay, now to get into more of the like meat of dredging at the mouth of the Columbia River. This is what a typical year looks like. Um, you can see the channel. There's the, the more thicker black lines is the extent of the mouth of the Columbia River Federal Navigation Channel, which is six miles long. Uh, you can see it's kind of broken up into quadrants and that's just for helping us assign material um, to different, the two dredge boats. And then also each quadrant has um, a different authorized depth. So the northern two quadrants, which are bigger, they are authorized to a depth of 55 feet. So that's the depth where we take the sand from. If it's shallower than 55 feet, we remove it from the channel. So that's shown in the kind of the red highlight. That's the sand. Um, the survey is from 2023, so it's kind of like last year's dredging. And then the orange is um, what's called advanced maintenance depth, or yeah, advanced maintenance. So advanced maintenance is basically we dredge past authorized depth, depth, which we're allowed to do up to five feet. And so we do that so that when it's not the weather window where we can dredge, the channel stays in the project depth longer. So if we go over, it takes longer for all that sand to accumulate and get to the point where we need to dredge again. So every year we try to go for the advanced maintenance step, which is 60 feet. Um, but sometimes, you know, due to weather and other conflicts, we're only able to get to 55 feet. Um, the lower Columbia River is maintained to 43 feet. Um, and so the mouth is different because the mouth still has influence from the ocean. And so we have to take into account swells. So that's why it's maintained to a deeper, um, level than the lower Columbia. Um, let's see what else. So, all of this is we dredge 3 million cubic yards of sand a year. And I feel like I'm throwing around numbers, but that's such a large amount. Um, I'm a visual person, so 
Um, at first, I'm like, what is 3 million cubic yards? Um, if you think of like a, a porta potty or like a honey bucket, that can fit two cubic yards. And so think of over a million porta potties. <laughs> <laughs> and that's like the volume that we dredge from the channel every single year. Um, so it's it's kind of incredible, and that's why it takes two dredges to do it every single year. Um, and it's because of our limited work window. Um, the weather's only good June through October. Um, so yeah, this is an important slide. I'm trying to think what else. Oh yeah, we sample um, the sediment in the channel periodically. And the mouth of the Columbia River is actually 99% clean sand. So it's like a very valuable resource and it's a finite resource. So, um, you know, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. When life gives you three million cubic yards of clean <laughs> sand, you don't just want to waste it. So that's kind of our, our thought process when it comes to managing this, this valuable resource. And that is where does sand go? We want to keep it in the system. We don't want to waste it. And that's a little counterintuitive because, you know, why would you dredge it out of the mouth and then keep it in the system? Wouldn't it just go right back into the channel? Well, not necessarily if you strategically place it in areas that we've monitored and make sure do not go back into the federal navigation channel. So now I'm going to go into depth of how we chose these certain placement sites. We didn't just draw random boxes in the ocean and start placing there. Um, we have a lot of science that happened and research um, to make these. Um, so you can kind of see the boxes. Um, the ones closer to shore are, are what we call near shore beneficial use placement sites. And so if we place in those ones closer to the shoreline, that sand stays in the system. Um, often it feeds the beaches there. So if you've ever been to Fort Stevens or Cape's Appointment, you know, we like the beaches there. So we want to make sure they don't erode and disappear. Um, so part of it is we place sand in those near shore environments so it feeds those beaches. Um, it's also really helpful um, to maintain the jetty foundation and route. So um, you can kind of see the north jetty site. Ooh. Yeah, over there, um, right along the North Jetty, we place material there and that feeds um, the North Jetty to make sure it's also protected from wave action. Um, some other benefits, it reduces the cost for the dredging program, which is kind of a win-win. You know, we're keeping the sand in the system and we're saving money. Um, as a government, we do have to choose the like least cost option when it comes to dredging. And so, um, you know, we wanted to make sure that we were doing it in a smart way. And so these near shore sites, um, they save money because the non near shore site is called the deep water site. And that's this one way off the, the shore. <coughs> and any sand placed in there does not come back to the system. Um, there was a study done called um, where they researched the depth of closure which the depth of closure is basically the depth at which if you place material anywhere shallower than that depth, it stays within the system. But if you place it outside that depth deeper, it washes away, it goes to the deep ocean, it doesn't come back and feed the beaches. Um, so at the mouth of the Columbia River, that depth is 65 feet. And so all these near shore sites are 65 feet or shallower and close to the coastline. All right, I think we'll touch on the other ones. Um, it's better to distribute the material through placement sites. Um, you know, when we're talking about 3 million cubic yards, if we were to put that all in one placement site, we basically create like an underwater like little mountain. And we don't wanna do that because that changes the environment. You know, that could increase the wave action happening in that area and it could be very dangerous. Um, so we definitely do not do that <laughs> anymore. Um, so yeah, this is kind of a conceptual model for what our placement sites, our placement site strategy is. Um, like I said, we have a, 
whole array of survey vessels. So before we start dredging for the season, the survey vessels go and they survey all the placement sites. And then during the dredge season, the hopper dredges place material in these sites, normally during the late summer. And then during the fall and winter, um, we let mother nature basically do its job. So winter, fall is where the extreme storms come in, like massive waves, just move sediment all around. Um, and we just let it happen, um, feed the beast basically. Mm -hmm. And so the waves push the sand that we place out of those placement sites. And then in the spring, we get a new survey and we can kind of calculate how much sand has moved out of that site and then how much capacity we have to place sand in there again. And so it's kind of like a cycle where we survey, dredge, survey, or like let Mother Nature do its job, survey again, and then calculate. Um, and we do that um, in joint with EPA. Um, we make this document every year called the Annual Use Plan. And we basically just go over our previous year's dredging season and then what our future year looks like and the capacity at each placement site. Um, each placement site also has certain criteria um, for weather windows just based on like fishing seasons. Um, and they also have like mound heights that we are limited to so we can't get above a certain height in the placement because we don't want to change the environment. You know, we want to do no harm and place it in a smart way where we don't do any massive changes to the environment. Okay, so this is kind of what a typical overall dredge season looks like. Um, again, it's kind of tying it all together. The red area is the mouth of the Columbia River Federal Navigation Channel. So we dredge there typically 2.6 to 3.1 million cubic yards, at least for the past like 10 years. Um, and then you see the array of all the placement sites, which are in blue. Um, each placement site, it's hard to see, but I put a number in there, and that's kind of the, the capacity of each placement site each year. Um, the shallow water site, which is here, is our most dynamic site. Um, I don't know if anyone, you know, has fish out there, but off the tip of the North Jetty, it's a, it's a pretty treacherous area. I don't think people really like hang around there um, because sand's just always being churning in that area and the water is churning up north. Um, so we place a lot of material there and I'll kind of go into depth about each placement site and why we chose each placement site. So kind of goes back to jetty construction. Um, when we constructed these jetties, um, rapid morphology accretion happened, which basically a bunch of sand just came and distributed along the jetty, um, which was good because, you know, the sand protects the jetty. Since then though, um, the Benson Beach area, which is that sand area, has receded 2,000 feet since 1939. Note it's still not at the original shoreline before the jetties were put in, um, but it has receded a lot. Um, and so here we are where all this sand is disappearing and then we have all this sand, clean sand that we're dredging why don't we help this problem and use that sand to feed Benson Beach and the North Jetty? So that's kind of our thought process for both the North Jetty site. So the North Jetty site, um, you can see it just pops up in black. Um, that one's used to reduce the scour rate along the southern toe of the North Jetty. We place um, a very small amount in there every year. It uh, doesn't need much, it's a pretty small site. And if we place a lot of material in there, that is the one site where like a very small amount does creep back into the channel. So we kind of limit our placement to like 300,000 cubic yards, which is still a lot of pork bodies. <laughs> um, and then we have the shallow water site, um, which again is our most dynamic site. Um, that one feeds material onto peacock spit, um, which if you, have, if you haven't heard of peacock spit and class up spit, we like those two because they protect the jetties 
and they kind of narrow in the navigation channel to keep the velocity in there and kind of self flush the navigation channel. Um, so we want to feed those spits to like keep the land and keep the jetties protected. And so the shallow water site, again, that material that we place in there moves north and it feeds peacock spit. And so it reduces the rate of erosion affecting the north jetty. And then it also reduces the shoreline erosion in the areas um, north of the mouth of the Columbia River. And so we place around like one to two million cubic yards um, a year in that site. So a majority of it goes into that site because it's so dynamic. I don't expect you to read all this or understand it, um, but overall this just um, is one way we tested these sites and like looked at like why did we pick these sites. Um, we analyzed or we observed that the bathymetry change was a reliable method for identifying the sediment transport trends. Um, so the bathymetry is basically just like topography but underwater. Um, so we get you know frequent surveys and we can see from the frequent surveys and like evaluating like a difference plot, we can see where the sand is accumulating and where it's eroding. And then we can strategically place sand where there's a lot of movement and then mother nature just takes care of it. Um, so in the like kind of Christmas color figure, um, that's peacock spit. And so you can see the shallow water site, that red is like the dredge material we placed in that site. And you can see it's moving north and feeding peacock spit. Okay. And then we also did sediment tracer studies. Um, so observed bathymetry isn't enough to just decide to place there. Um, so we did a lot of other studies like the sediment tracer study. Um, the one with the pink dots is again that shallow water site off of the North Jetty. Um, you can see that, so the sediment tracer study is basically these like particles that you can track they're like the size of sand and we place them like they're sand into the placement site and then we're able to track those particles and so you can see the pink dots are kind of where the concentration of those particles go after six months and so you can see basically all of them go north they feed peacock spit none of them are going back into the navigation channel because we don't want that um and yeah Basically, it's confirming our logic behind the bathymetry change evaluation that the sand is moving north. And then on south of the mouth of the Columbia River is the other graphic. Um, also did a tracer study there. And you can also see, um, that one's a little more crazy, they go both directions, but we place them on different sides of the site. And you can see it, it still stays in the south area of the mouth of the Columbia River. A lot of it goes towards the shoreline and feeds the beaches. Um, a lot of the yellow areas, which is um, the north side of the site, feed that south jetty. Um, and then very little kind of creeps its way back up into the channel, but a lot of it actually swings around and feeds class of spit, um, which is also very important. All right, a lot of our stakeholders um, you know, our environmental like resource agency, crab fishermen, um, they wanted us to make sure that we are doing no harm to the crab population out there, um, which is very important. And so in order to place in these near shore sites, we needed to prove that we weren't killing or burying the crab population out there. Um, Cause those placement sites are in areas where there are crab and where fishermen tend to go. So we partnered with NOAA and other resource agencies um, to do this research. Um, NOAA actually has the final paper coming out this year that kind of goes over all the research that was done for this effort, so keep a lookout for that. But essentially, um, there's this contraption at the bottom that was used. It kind of acts like a, kind of like a crab pot where we like put it on the bottom of the ocean floor in the south jetty site. So in that placement site, south of the south jetty. And then there was a camera attached to it and then crab bait and then um, like a tape measure. So 
super complicated, but <laughs> we were able, it worked, we were able to see the effects of what the dredge passing over that area did to the crabs. And the important thing is that we had to use a thin layer placement technique, um, which is essentially where the dredge like opens the door slightly and then continues to move while it's placing the material. So it essentially like crop dust the ocean floor. Like it just spreads this like thin layer of sand. And so um, you can see this is after the hopper dredge has passed over. You can see it says the deposited dredge material, the sand was only 2.54 centimeters. So one inch has been deposited. Um, the, there's a whole video on YouTube that shows like every single frame. Um, it has, you know, the crabs were there at the beginning, it was eaten, and then they sensed the plume coming, they like scurried away. And then um, this frame is one and a half minutes after the dredge passed, and then the crabs returned within five to seven minutes unharmed. So, um, yeah, we consider this a success. Noah also and the crab fishermen um, were very, we had many meetings with them to make sure like they were okay with all this. Um, so yeah, it was overall a success. Um, and we applied this thin layer placement method to all of our near shore dredge sites. Um, so kind of that first graphic I showed when I was going over dredging where the plume just like comes down and one, um, we don't do that in the near shore sites. We do it in the deep water because um, it doesn't have, it's super deep out there. Um, but in the near shore sites, we have to use the thin layer placement technique. And that's also um, a plus because it avoids mounding again. We don't want to create mounds on the ocean floor. Okay, I think this is the last of like research modeling. Um, but after the bathymetry change, the sediment tracer study, the crab research. We also worked with USGS to create this very intricate model and they've been working on this for the past like decade. They still use this um, and still tweak it um, with new information that we get every year. Um, and so this model is a hydrodynamic model for sediment transport at the mouth of the Columbia River. Um, so I don't really expect you to see this but um, the net bed load transport which is this side. Um, that's kind of what we're really looking at because that's where the dredge material goes, is the bed, the bottom of the ocean. Um, so you can see this is fall winter conditions where we you know, want the sand and want mother nature to move around. This model shows that it does indeed move around. Um, you can see again off the tip of the North Jetty, um, it's just going around this North Jetty and feeding the north part of the mouth of the Columbia River. And then south, you can also see the arrows going towards the shore. So if we place in that South Jetty site, it feeds this southern part of the mouth of the Columbia River. So that's kind of the gist of this slide. We, so that was just kind of touching each one of the um, monitoring and research parts that we did. This is kind of like the full list of our monitoring program and how we decided to um, choose all these different placement sites. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details, but um, we did a lot of work and now we're able to place material in the near shore because of all the work we did. Forgot about the slide. Even though we did all the research, before we were going to go into full operation, we did pilot placements. So even with all the research, we still wanna make sure all of our research and monitoring was correct, and our, all of our hypotheses were correct. So we did pilot placements at each of the near shore sites. So this is kind of the plan for the South Jetty site and then the North Head site. Um, which is the newest site. It actually came fully operational back in like 2020, so pretty new. Um, but this is kind of like the pilot placement plans for those sites. And we basically just strategically placed a smaller amount of dredge material in different arrays in the placement site, and then we tracked them through surveys. So you can see here, 
um, we place kind of this, you know, mound, not mound, but like an area of sand in the placement site, and then we continually surveyed and watched it like move towards the beach, which is what all the modeling and all our observations um, sh have shown. So we weren't surprised by this, but this kind of confirms that all that data was correct. And if we do place sand in these near shore sites, they do move towards the shore because of storms and mother nature. Um, and then on the side is kind of the modeling results. So even with these observed observ like changes, we ran it through the model to see if it did the same thing that it did in real life, um, which kind of proves that you know our model is working. So that basically gets us to our active sites at the mouth of the Columbia River. Um, again, there's the North Head site, which is the newest site. Um, we did pilot placements in 2018 through 2020, and then it became fully operational and is still used to this day. Um, it's kind of nice because I started as project manager in like 2021, so I had all these sites to choose from. Um, we have the shallow water site, like I said, it was one of our first sites. Um, but it is still active. Again, we use that almost every single year and put the majority of our um, placement in that site. We have the North Jetty site, which was active in 1999 and is still active. And then we have the South Jetty site. That one's also a relatively new site. Um, we did pilot placement starting in 2012, um, and I believe it was fully operational by 2014, and we still place material there. The sites are as large as they are, again, because of the thin layer placement methods. Um, so the dredge is required to transit through like a minimum number of cells. We like create cells within all these placement sites and we tell the dredge you have to transit through like 10 or six or four, um, just so that they know like where to go and how long they have to go to place that thin layer of material on the ocean floor. Um, and yeah, again, the deep water site, we only use that, we call it for foul weather backup. Um, so if the near shore sites, if the weather is not conducted to place there, just because they are closer to the shore, so when big storms and waves come in, they're often, it's more dynamic closer to the shore. And so in those instances, sometimes the dredges do have to place at the deep water site, um, but we try to limit that because again, it's wasting the material. Um, and so with that, I think that is the end of my presentation. Um, I think it's time for questions. I'm going to come around with the microphone, and if anyone has a question, just raise your hand. I'll run over to you, and then we can all hear the question. First of all, thank you for your presentation. Great job. And when I grow up, I want to do what you do. <laughs> so you, your education, you probably you talked about it. I know you're from Kansas. Yes. Where did you go to school? Um, I went to Kansas State University. Um, yeah, studied civil engineering, but I emphasized in more hydraulic and, and environmental engineering, so like river transport, sediment transport. Yeah. What equipment do you use to conduct the surveys? Yeah, so we have uh, about like five survey boats that go out there and they the mouth of columbia they do a single beam survey uh, which is basically just like stripes um, they can't get the full data set because that would take forever um, but yeah we basically survey the mouth probably every other month of the year um, and yeah we use all those survey vessels and same with the placement sites um, a lot of times we use when we can, we try to get multi-beam surveys because that covers the most area and is the most accurate data. 
And yeah. do you go out? I do not. Okay. No, I wish. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. This was like really exciting for me. Um, I have some words of appreciation and some remarks and also a question. Um, I just really appreciated how you showed all of the like the tracker, like particles and all that stuff and, and just why, why the project was happening and everything. Um, my question is, um, Initially, you started the conversation saying that this is like an issue with the sand that needs to be moved out. And I'm just wondering, before that was started, um, I, I'd love to hear a little bit of um, some of the research or ideas of stopping the problem upstream or limiting the problem upstream. Um, and if that's even a thing. No, that's a great question. Um, so at the mouth of the Comey River, actually a lot of the sediment doesn't necessarily come from the river. Um, a lot of it is pushed in from the ocean during those big storms. And so if you kind of saw where the dredging shoals happened, there was one kind of offshore and that's due to a lot of the ocean conditions. And the other one um, is kind of the sediment coming in from the sides, but also just kind of the confluence of the river and the ocean. Um, so yeah, but mainly the material um, from at least our coastal engineers that I've talked to comes from a lot of it is the ocean and the winter storms, the sediment being brought in there. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, talking about Benson Beach, you said when the North Jetty was built, all that sand filled in where the campground basically is now. But then, did I hear you say it's receding now? Yes. And what would be causing it to recede if it grew so large? Yeah, so the jetties, the like when the jetty was built, all the sand accumulated like right next to the jetty. But since then, Mother Nature is basically trying to go back to its original conditions of before the jetty. And so sand, is very dynamic you know when there's these big storms it's easy for erosion to happen and eat away at the sand and there's nothing there at benson beach to protect the sand from staying there so that's why it's receded like 2,000 feet since like it's just ocean storms like the crazy conditions out here just eating away gradually um, and so this north head site since it is new we're hoping you know that feeds more of the sediment budget um, a lot of these sites, we're not going to see it anytime really quickly. Um, it takes time for the sand to move on to, to where we actually see an effect on the shoreline. Um, but we're hoping that it gets to that point where like, we can see the sand building back up um, at Benson Beach. So these near shore sites are relatively new, like within the last 20 years. Or so. Yes, the North Head site and the South Jetty site, the shallow water site has been around for a while, but we haven't always used the thin layer placements. Um, that's kind of back in the day when people didn't really like the Army Corps, honestly, and we just kind of did what we thought was right back then um, and kind of created some mounds in that site, and that caused some problems. Um, and so, really, in the like 1990s is when we really kind of turned to making sure we're doing no harm. So before the 1990s, was most of the dredge spoils going out to sea, out to deep water? Yeah, so it's going to the deep water and that shallow water site, which is technically near shore, but again, not in the way we do it now. Yeah. Great question. Thank you for all this information. It's wonderful, and your presentation style is magnificent. Thank you. Um, how long does it take the hopper to fill and then release through the thin layer process? That's a great question. It takes, I mean, it depends on the kind of condition and where they're dredging in the channel. You know, when it's really deep shoals, it's easy for them to just scoop it all up. But if they're kind of like scraping the bottom, it takes a lot long longer. Um, but it's like several hours to fill a load of the hopper dredge. 
yeah and so then once they transit i believe the whole like the south jetty site is the one where they have to transit the longest that whole placement then takes like maybe like 10 minutes i don't know terry thumbs up does that sound right yeah. Okay. <laughs> Terry works with me, and he was actually on the drug Essions for a while, so. Um, over the past uh, 20, 25 years, plastic spit has receded quite a bit. Yes. Is that Mother Nature cause, or is that in any way due to dredging? Yeah, so from my understanding, it's a lot like Mother Nature. Um, because of the jetties, you know, like we're trying to control Mother Nature in a sense, but that's kind of impossible. Um, so Kata Spit is just sand. And so again, sand is really easy to erode. Um, so we are trying to, like in the more recent years, it has um, accelerated in its rate of erosion. So we're really, really trying to look for ways to um, kind of feed that area more. Um, so we realize it is a problem. Um, and if you've been to um, Fort Stevens, uh, the jetty repair area, they actually had to put in a, a rock revetment along the road, the jetty road out there, because it has eroded so much that it almost took out the park road. So um, yeah, we're definitely looking at ways to use the dredge sediment. Um, but processes to create new dredge uh, placement sites. It, it takes a while, so, um, yeah. When uh, you showed us the, the thing about the markers, to where was the sand going? What is, it, what is, what are those markers? You said they're the size of a grain of sand, but what, what are they made of that they can track it? That's a great question. I wasn't involved in the sediment tracer study, so I don't know if I could really speak to it. Um, I know they released a paper about it, like a research paper about it, so I could probably track down, but yeah, I don't know exactly like what it's made of or how they track it. I know a lot of that story and out by Alderbrook was all fill in with dredging. Was that anything that had to do with Corps of Engineers or was that way before that? That's a great question. I don't know if I know the answer. Uh, Terry, do you know? I think that was mostly pre uh, core dredging projects. Yeah. Okay. Or, or maybe dredging. Yeah. yeah. Great question. Please tell me. <laughs> um, I uh, actively involved with the yacht club and we do racing on the lower river. And one of the things I do is place uh, racing marks. And we mostly race below the bridge um, down to. 29, 27, so 30, 35A to 27. And Desmona Shoals has rapidly changed in the last four or five years. There's some fingers that have shoaled in along towards the channel in the area that we sail at. Is there a way to find a more accurate survey of that area? So uh, that area is um, my coworker, She's the project manager for the lower Columbia River. I kind of stop at the mouth. But um, all of our hydro surveys that we run is available on our core website. Um, if you just like Google Portland District Army Corps of Engineers hydro surveys, it has each sheet that you can go in and look at the PDF and actually look at um, what the conditions are. And in the lower Columbia, they run those surveys um, once a month. So. Yes. Yep, that's the one that surveys one, the one of the things that uh, we, we have a grounding area that we have to watch out for quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, the piles on the uh, lower end of Desmond Shoals used to have a short spit that came out of it, and that's grown from about 100 yards from that pile to almost 400 yards out. Wow. And uh, maybe we've got a lot of groundings there. <laughs> Yeah. I know that personally because I put anchors on it. <laughs> <laughs> we had five boats go aground once a couple of years ago. Oh my back. gosh. Yeah. So anyway, that's, that's yeah. pretty much experienced that. And same thing from upriver. It's good to know. So on your website, there's a particular spot we can go to? 
Google. Yeah, I mean, if you just Google Portland District Army Corps of Engineers Hydro Surveys, it should take you there. Like one of the first results should be our page. Um, and then it's kind of split up between the coast and then like the Columbia River. So you'll just kind of have to, you know, click Columbia River and then click Desarrolla. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right, well, let's give Julia one last round of applause. So next week, as Julia mentioned at the beginning of her talk, we're gonna have Captain Dan Jordan here from the Columbia River Bar Pilots. So that's gonna be at 11 o'clock right here in this room next week on Tuesday, February 13th. We're also collaborating with the Columbian Theater down the road on Friday, March 8th for International Women's Day. And so we're gonna do a screening of the documentary Maiden, which is talking about one of the first all-female crews to race the Whitbread Round the World race in 1989. So if you would like a special discount on those tickets, $5 rather than $10 at the door, there's a half sheet of paper at the front desk that you can go ahead and pick up and then you can get that half price for Friday, March 8th. And then last but not least, we'll wrap up our past present lecture series on Tuesday, February 20th with Sandra Yanone. She is a poet and author talking about her new book, Boats for Women. And then in March, on the, I believe, 19th, that will be uh, Ed Joyce, who is a professor at Clatsop Community College, talking about the history of coastal oceanography in our area. So thank you all so much for coming today. Thank you, Julia, again, and have a great rest of your day.